so, so for, for me, this, this story um, that I tell in, in migrating to prison America's obsession with, with locking up immigrants um, is, is one that stems from, from my own uh, personal lived experience of, of migration um, that is in, in many ways um, a story of my family, like it's a story for families of, of many of you who, who are, are here tonight. So I was, I was born and, and raised in McAllen, Texas. It's um, a, a city on the, uh, in southeastern Texas, a, a few miles north of the, the Rio Grande River. Um, and and I, I, I mentioned that because, of course, the river is the, is the waterway that brought people to this region. It's a hot place, it's a semi-arid place, it's a difficult place in which to, to make a life. Um, and, and, and yet it is, the, the, and, and, and so because of the, that difficulty, the, the, the waterway is, is why people settled there. Um, and that happened long before that same waterway formed, became, transformed into the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, my family straddled the formal international boundary between these two countries. Uh, the, my parents' work did so as well. Um, the births of my, um, my, my siblings did. And of course, um, for, for much of my life, uh, my daily existence did as, as well. Uh, for us, border crossings were absolutely routine. They were just a routine, ordinary facet of life. This, was, this, uh, this happened for, uh, for family visits. We, we crossed the border to go shopping, um, to go to medical appointments, to see doctors. Um, we had very much a binational, uh, a bicultural, a bilingual uh, family, we still do, um, that was at once in two worlds. And yet, at the same time, it was also, we were also living a very singular experience. It is the distinct ex experience of a life in the borderlands. So there in, in, in South Texas, my parents managed to raise uh, five kids. I'm the youngest of five. So five kids uh, in a migrant farm worker housing project. Um, and they did so in the way that many other families uh, managed to get by, by, by scrimping and, and by scrounging. So we recycled cans, aluminum cans, um, not for the environmental benefits. Um, we recycled cans for cash. Uh, we would get money um, that our family needed. Um, we would stand in line at the housing project when um, the trucks would come from the, from the county government um, bringing, bringing um, surplus government cheese and surplus government peanut butter. Um, and for that was that was just that was normal. We didn't know um, any other other uh, way of doing things, and and and, and much of that um, can be explained by um, the fact that my parents didn't have much by way of formal education. Uh, my father finished high school in Texas. Uh, my mother finished the third grade in the small town in the. Um, uh, Mexican state of, of Querétaro in, in central Mexico that, that she was born in, that she was raised in. I mean, she went through the third grade um, because that was it. That, that, was, that was the extent of um, school that existed in her, in her little, uh, little vill village. And in our family um, mythology, um, uh, she actually went, there, went to third grade twice. Um, and it wasn't because she was doing poorly. Um, it was because she liked it so much. Uh, she didn't want to stop going to school, but when third grade is, is all, all you can get through, well, she was able to convince her, her father to allow her to, to stay um, for, for, for an extra year. And so, um, so my parents didn't have much, by, by much formal education, but I, I still don't know whether it's um, uh, despite that or whether it's because of that, um, but for them, Education for their kids was absolutely everything. Uh, they, they filled my mind, they filled my siblings' minds um, with the ambition for learning that they had had, but that they had been unable to fulfill formally for themselves. Uh, and so they prepared me to thrive in worlds that, they, that I, I didn't know existed, that I think that they didn't know existed. 
And so when I left that in-between space of the borderlands, ni, ni de aquí, ni, ni de allá, it's often said, I found myself startled and entirely unmoored in the imposing halls of the university that I, um, that I was attending, Brown University in, in, in Rhode Island. Um, I mean, the, the extent of, of I, I love Brown, but, but the extent of, of wealth and the different cultural norms and expectations um, were absolutely jarring. I mean, so, 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 so unfamiliar that I, um, I, I, I think at times I didn't realize that I was out of place. I mean, that was how, 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 how much it, I, I was out of place. Um, and yet I got through that, and, um, and eventually I, I, I managed to find myself in, into, in, in, in law school. And, and again, I was, uh, I, was, I, was, uh, I was disoriented um, uh, once again um, by, by, by that experience. Um, and yet I found the courage to keep moving forward, to keep evolving um, uh, as, as, a, as a person and, and growing as a student um, in that childhood. In that childhood of crossing boundaries, it was through those experiences far away from the South Texas community that initially breathed life into me uh, that I came to see what was a, not apparent to me as a child. So as a kid, knowing no other way of life, I, I had been unable to see the power of that border over the bodies that dared to cross it. I did not know that the border patrol, that La Migra, was not an everyday feature of life, as experienced by most people in the United States, because it was an everyday feature of life, as experienced by most people in my life. I did not know that checkpoints an hour north of the border would raise eyebrows outside of the region. I did not know that there was anything strange about the occasional tío sleeping on a couch in our living room because he was trying to make his way back to his job somewhere up north. And so I did not realize the power that the law had on my daily experience, on the experience of others in my community, until I found myself outside of that familiar space and managed to, and, and had the opportunity to reflect on where it is that I'd been. But there was one facet of South Texas that continued to remain hidden from my view until I actually returned to the region as a newly minted lawyer, with a shiny new bar card in hand. And I, I went back so that I could join my, uh, my brothers in representing migrants, both of whom are older, I like to point out, um, but both of whom are relevant to, to you are, are SU grads. Um, I, have a, I have a family of three, three SU uh, law grads, uh, my, my two brothers and, and one of my sisters-in-law. Um, so, so uh, a familiar, um, I mean, a familiar uh, family uh, environment at the very least. And so I, I went back to South Texas to join my, my two brothers um, in the work of representing migrants who were facing deportation proceedings. And, 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 and once I started doing that work, I learned of this facet of life in South Texas that had previously been unknown to me. And that is the, 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 the experience of, or the existence of immigration prisons. So all of a sudden I found myself representing clients in detention centers that I hadn't known existed. They were, sometimes they were surrounded by onion fields, like stinky onion fields that go on forever. Uh, sometimes they were, they were um, surrounded by wildlife refuges gorgeous um, and natural environments. But they were always remote, even by South Texas standards. And so these prisons were housing incarcerated individuals, and it turns out they'd been there all along. Only I'd been completely unaware of that. 
So in effect, they, they had been, for me at least, hidden in plain sight. And I remember vividly the very first time that I drove to one of these facilities, the, the Port Isabel Detention Center, which is about 1,500 beds. Um, and it's been around since the mid-1980s. As I drove there on a small two-lane road that I'd never been on before, I actually pulled over at, at one point just to admire the scenery. There were these native bamboos growing out of small, a series of small lakes. There were these gorgeous white birds that were perched along the edge. Uh, they're egrets, I now know. I didn't know that at the time. And so in the two decades or so that I'd lived in, the, in South Texas before then, I'd never seen anything like this. This is a part of the, of the, of the region that's actually really, I now know, is actually really well known outside of the region. It's, a, it's actually an important part of the, the um, local economy because a lot of people from places like this, from the Midwest, other parts of the United States, go down there to look at the birds. It's a wildlife refuge that's famous for um, being a nesting area, a resting stop um, for migratory uh, birds that are heading back and forth from, from Central America in, in, in particular. But I'm not a birder. And I don't know any birders. I, I still think I don't know. I, I don't know any birders even now. I definitely know, didn't know anyone who was, who was um, doing any birding uh, back when I was growing up. So I stopped to look at this and was absolutely stunned by what I saw. Uh, but I had an actual job to do, so um, I had to get back in the car. Um, and so I did, and I continued along my way, and I didn't stop again until I reached the guardhouse at the entrance to the Port Isabel Detention Center. Fencing surrounds the, the imposing concrete walls of what is a series of prison buildings. You go through one security checkpoint just to get into the parking lot, and then another to enter the facility. And once you do that, once you get past the second layer of security checkpoints, then you're inside and there are steel doors and there are surveillance cameras watching everything and there are escorts. And then there's a cinder block visitation room where the rare attorney meets with clients. And I say rare attorney because in immigration court there is no right to government appointed counsel, which means if you're lucky enough to find somebody to work for free, great. And if you're not, then you need to find the money to pay for someone, someone like, like me. Right? And most people who were locked up there were not so fortunate. So it's not because of anything I brought to the table. It's simply because most people simply didn't have the money to hire uh, a private, private attorney. And so they were going through the process completely by themselves, the process of trying to find a legal basis to stay in the United States. So that was then, and, and now, now I'm privileged to, to call myself, uh, uh, I'm still a lawyer, uh, I'm a law professor, uh, I'm a teacher, I'm a, I'm a writer. I've, been, I've written for more than a decade about the ever-growing intersection between criminal law and immigration law, about the criminalization of, of migrants themselves and of migration. And people often ask me, well, how long have you been working on this, on this book? And the honest answer is that I can't really tell you because I, I don't know. I'm not trying to keep anything from you. I, I actually just don't know. Um, the idea for the book probably started on that drive to the Port Isabel Detention Center. And more fundamentally, started when I was a child. And in my view, my child's eye view, the law was nothing more than the power of the border patrol to decide who could live with their families, to decide who could go to work or go to school. So I, I think that it's accurate to say that as long as I have been doing this work, as long as I have lived this work, I've had this book in mind somewhere, even if it didn't look like a book. So incarceration is just the harshest reality of this trend. 
It's the part of immigration policing that led to the death of a gentleman named Kamyar Samimi. 40 years in the United States and a, and a green card in his hand. And I showed up at his door one day and took him down to a private immigration prison in, in suburban Denver, in Aurora. And two weeks later, he was dead. And the government's press release said that he died suddenly. The government's internal investigation report released over a year later and only after a journalist filed an open records request. That investigation report said that the prison's doctor never bothered to see Mr. Samimi. And it added that the nurses at the facility did not follow the doctor's instructions about how to care for Mr. Samimi. So immigration prisons are the places where the government, where our government, or we, the people, oversee suffering, where quality of life suffers, and indeed where at times life goes to end. And for those reasons, I have concluded that immigration prisons are not defensible. In this book, Migrating to Prison, I trace how the United States once shut down its immigration prisons and how for 25 years after that, life went on without them. And I also describe how starting in the late 1970s, the United States built the largest immigration prison system in the world. Today, the United States locks up roughly half a million people every year because the government thinks that they violated immigration law. In immigration prisons, there are people held under the power of what lawyers call civil law because the government says that they might not belong here. And then there are people held under the power of criminal law because the government wants to punish them for having come here. Uh, today, immigration prisons are everywhere. And they take just about every form, from an old motel that I visited in Tucson to a 1,400-bed concrete fortress alongside a Superfund site in Tacoma. Some people are there because the government wants to strip them of permission to be here. Take Jerry Armijo who I spoke to when I was uh, writing this book. Raised in South Texas, not far from where I grew up, we were both born into a poor, overwhelmingly Mexican community in, in South Texas. Only I was born north of the Rio Grande River, and he was born on its southern side. So I was born a US citizen, and he was not. After high school, I went off to the Ivy League, and he joined the army and went off to Iraq. So I was being shocked by a different culture, and he was getting shocked by bombs. And when he returned with a leg injury and psychological trauma, he didn't get the support that he needed. And so like, people, like many people have done before him, he fell into drugs and eventually into the criminal justice system. And one day, ICE picked him up and sent him to a local immigration prison and started the process of trying to deport him. One bomb, a shoddy mental health care system and a few bad decisions, and all of a sudden, Jerry turned from being a war hero to being what politicians like to call a criminal alien. And still others are locked up because they dared to seek safety in the United States. A federal law is clear that if you are in this country and you are afraid for your life, then you can apply, apply for asylum. It does not matter where you came from. It does not matter how you got here. 
And yet, coming to the United States without the federal government's permission is also a federal crime. So this is why in the summer of 2018, we saw federal officials taking parents from their kids. Children were being sent off to places like this old motel in Tucson that's surrounded by tall fencing. It's monitored by 24-7 security cameras. And meanwhile, the parents are being, were being prosecuted. And before then and since then, kids have been confined alongside their parents. Kids like Diego Rivera Osorio. When he was just one year old, Diego's mother, Wendy, decided that life in Honduras was too dangerous for them to stay. And so like people from all over the world have done for generations, Diego and Wendy turned to the United States for safety. They came here and they asked for asylum. And within a few days, they found themselves in an old nursing home outside of Philadelphia that ICE calls a family residential center. Well, critics call it a baby jail. Diego and Wendy were stuck. They can't leave. They couldn't leave. Inside that old nursing home, waiting for the legal process to slowly grind forward. Remember, he was just one when he arrived. Diego was three by the time he got out. And eventually, he won his legal case to stay in the United States, but not before 650 nights had passed. I tell, I tell the story of Diego in, in, in the book, and I tell the story of many other migrants who are caught up in one way or another in the immigration prison system. But in the book, I, I make the case that immigration prisons are, are not just inhumane. They're, they're also created to serve purposes that many of us would not condone, even imagine. They're not about keeping us safe. They're not about promoting justice, and they're not about enforcing the law. They're about electing politicians and about fueling the profits of private prison corporations and of local economies. Now, these are not reasons to take away someone's liberty, anyone's liberty. To, to, to give you a little bit of context about this, the political underpinnings of the immigration prison system that, that we rely on so heavily today, let me read a passage from, uh, from, from, from the book that, that takes us back to 2014, November 2014, the, the Obama era. In a primetime immigration speech on November 20th, 2014, President Obama explained that his administration's immigration enforcement priorities target felons, not families, criminals, not children, and gang members, not a mom who's working hard to provide for her kids. Well, President Obama's exhortation is as good as an example as President Trump's trite comment about targeting bad hombres. I, I, I'm preparing, I've, I've tried, to, tried to mimic the way his pronunciation. <laughs> I can't, I, I can't do justice to it, so just bad hombres. <laughs> Both of these simplify complex human beings. Felons are part of families. Just like one person's bad hombre might be another's father. It hurts that he was trying to be a dad and he can't, Cecilia Equihua said about her father locked up for returning to the United States to reunite with his kids. The easy sound bites make for politically useful talking points, but they're a lousy basis for public policy. The shifting sands of the political debate about which migrants deserve to live freely in the United States and which don't expose the pernicious edge of sorting the good from the bad. Listen to most elected officials talk about immigration and one commonality quickly becomes obvious. Everyone, it seems, wants to lock up and deport criminals. President Clinton signed laws that made it easier to land in an immigration prison and harder to get out. His successor, President Bush, inaugurated the era of hardline criminal prosecution of immigration law violators. 
President Obama and his top immigration officials repeatedly claimed to focus their resources on so-called criminal aliens and oversaw the largest immigration prison population in history until then. The Trump administration is not different. In his first week as president, Donald Trump signed an executive order declaring aliens who engage in criminal conduct in the United States to be a particularly significant threat to national security and public policy. Despite the consistent bipartisanship of tarring migrants who have committed a crime, it's impossible to sort the good from the bad consistently. Obama's felons, not families, remark categorized people into two boxes, family members on the one hand and criminals on the other. Trump uses two different categories, law-abiding citizens, almost always depicted as white, and law-breaking migrants, almost exclusively not white. Both categories are convenient rhetorical ploys that make for good sound bites, but neither can be defended logically. The criminals that Obama derided are also family members. Families include criminals, and criminals have families. Lots of crime, in fact, is committed against family members. Politicians and pundits inclined to dislike migrants have a sharp eye for their worst mistakes. When Iowa police pinned blame for the murder of white college student Molly Tibbetts on Cristian Baena Rivera, an unauthorized migrant from Mexico, Trump quickly stood in front of a camera and complained, we have tremendous crime trying to come through the border. In Trump's view, crimes, not people, cross the border. Uh, by contrast, President Obama was the opposite of Trump's crudeness and callousness. Still, the Obama administration heavily publicized its policy of targeting migrants with criminal histories while going easy on people who had avoided blemishes. Even the DACA program was off limits to young people who had been convicted of some crimes. Trump's complaint is certainly cruder than the Obama administration's policy, but both examples fit into a broader bipartisan pattern in political conversations, migrants are expected to be innocent. If they are not, they stop being in the good graces of policymakers and the laws they make. We love our victims innocent, writes the philosopher Madan Dolar. We empathize with them as long as they appear to be innocent. But the moment they display some trait that is not entirely amiable, the sympathy is cut short. For US citizens, Blemishes are to be expected because humans are imperfect creatures. We mess up. President Trump expressed support for his campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, who admitted to lying to the FBI. He pardoned his supporter, Joe Arpaio, who was convicted of disobeying court orders. But he regularly harps on about the dangers that migrants pose. When it comes to the aliens who migrate to the United States, Blemishes are red flags of which citizens should be wary. So this is a story, uh, the, the story of immigration and prisons and how we got here, why we do this, is certainly a story about politics. Uh, but it's also a story about money. For private businesses and local governments, immigration and prisons are an attractive financial spigot. In one year alone, Congress spent $2.7 billion, billion dollars on ICE's detention system. The two largest private prison corporations in the United States, CoreCivic and the GEO Group, which runs the Tacoma facility, get about half of their revenue from the federal government. Now, to elected officials, a threat to their high employment private prison is quite often a threat to their reelection bids. Now, let me, let, me, let me describe this relationship with another passage from the book that takes us to a rural part of New Mexico. Most days are quiet in Milan, New Mexico. The Wow Diner offers a 1950s throwback experience with red booths lining the U-shaped building. And the Kiva Cafe smothers its sopapillas in a red chili that screams New Mexico cuisine. If Milan's 3,000 residents want more options, they can jump on Interstate 40 
and head an hour and a half east to Albuquerque, unless they are locked up. Almost 40% of Milan's population lives inside the Cibola County Correctional Center, a monochromatic complex of beige buildings tucked behind the WOW Diner. Owned and run by CoreCivic, one of the two largest operators of private prisons in the U.S., for many years, the Cibola County Correctional Center held people convicted of entering the United States clandestinely, a federal crime. As convicted criminals, they were behind bars because they were being punished. Rings of concertina wire surround or stretched across the tops of two layers of fencing leave a clear impression that punishment is the goal. In return for running the Milan prison, CoreCivic received a steady revenue stream from the Justice Department's Bureau of Prisons. Milan, meanwhile, came to value the prison's place in the town's slumbering economy. Roughly 300 locals work there. When the Bureau of Prisons announced in July 2016 that it would not renew its contract with CoreCivic, which at the time was actually called the Corrections Corporation of America, a shudder jolted the community. One resident, reflecting on the many prison employees that she knew whose livelihoods were suddenly at risk, boiled down her thoughts to this. It sucks. That was the summer of 2016, and when that happened, the federal prison agency's decision to cut off the Cibola County facility seemed like a death nail. Who would want to do business with a prison so problematic that the Bureau of Prisons had decided to sever its 15-year relationship. Seeing the imminent hit to employment rise ominously on the economic horizon, local officials and CCA executives sprung into action. The consequences of the BOP's decision were frightening. For some officials, that made the path forward unambiguous. My first option is for it to stay private because of the revenue the prison produces for the city of Milan. The local state senator, Democrat Clemente Sanchez said. Well, before the month of October was out, Sanchez could breathe a sigh of relief and CCA officials could celebrate success. Another contract was in place, this time with the Department of Homeland Security, ICE. As the federal government's principal immigration law enforcement arm, ICE is tasked with detaining people facing the possibility of forcible removal through the nation's immigration court system. Except for when ICE officers mistakenly pick up a US citizen, which does happen, everyone locked up on behalf of ICE is either a migrant waiting to learn whether she will be allowed to remain in the United States, or a migrant already ordered removed awaiting the next available one-way spot on an airplane or bus. But unlike the Bureau of Prisons, ICE does not imprison to punish. It imprisons to give the federal government time to decide who gets to be in the United States and who does not. This isn't punishment, courts tell us. It's just deciding where on the map people should stand. Well, they should stand at the same facility where others were being punished not too long before. Well, politics and profits are the reasons why we lock up people, but they're not reasons that we should lock up anyone. And that's why in, in the end of the book, I call for abolishing immigration prisons, which, which I admit is not at all a small task. But it's also not impossible, as I said earlier. Uh, to begin with, it's been done before. Most people know something about Ellis Island, and, and when we think of Ellis Island, we think of it as that place that welcomed generations of newcomers to the United States. Well, it did that. But it was also an immigration prison with an ironic view of the Statue of Liberty. The anarchist Emma Goldman spent time there. The singer for the Metropolitan Opera, Ezio Pinza, did too. A little boy named George Zimmerman was born there, a different George Zimmerman. <laughs> Just like today, 
In the 1950s, immigration prisons like the one on Ellis Island were said to protect us from ungodly dangers. Today, it's terrorists and it's gangs. Back then, it was communism. The Soviet Union was recovering from an, um, the immense pounding that it had taken during World War II. The Cold War was beginning. And that little speck of land off the coast of Manhattan was supposed to keep us safe from people like a woman named Ellen Knopf. Ellen Knopf is somebody whose story I find fascinating. So let me share just a few paragraphs of her story. She was born in Germany, but she spent part of Hitler's reign in Czechoslovakia. When war caught up with her, she headed to England as a refugee, where there she worked for the Royal Air Force and then the United States Army. While helping the Allied forces, she met US citizen and Army veteran Kurt Knopf. After the war, the two married with the approval of the Army's commanding officer in Frankfurt taking advantage of the War Brides Act, a special immigration procedure created by Congress precisely to let war veterans return to the United States with their new wives, Ellen arrived in New York on August 14, 1948. That's when the honeymoon turned into a nightmare. Citing evidence that they refused to disclose even to the Noths, immigration officials at Ellis Island were anything but welcoming. Ellen was excluded from the United States and sent to the restrictive quarters of the island's immigration station to fight for her freedom. As we approached Ellis Island, she later wrote, I could see that parts of it were enclosed by double wire fences topped by barbed wire and marked by what appeared to be watchtowers. These fenced off areas were subdivided by more fences, which gave the whole place the look of a group of kennels. An official history published by the now defunct INS described it as a grueling detention-like penitentiary. Ellen wasn't even given a hearing at which she might claim her right to enter the United States or plead for mercy. Time and again, immigration officials denied Ellen's attempts to live freely in the United States with her husband. Time and again, they cited secret evidence that her admission would be prejudicial to the interests of the United States. Insistent, she fought her way all the way to the US Supreme Court where she found little comfort. The Constitution's promise of a fair hearing proved meaningless and despite Justice Robert Jackson letting her off Ellis Island in May 1949. His colleagues weren't so sympathetic. For people like Ellen, hoping to enter the United States, the court ruled, Congress can create any procedure it likes. Whatever the procedure authorized by Congress is, it is due process as far as an alien denied entry is concerned, the court wrote in January 1950. The next month, Ellen was back on the island, and eight decades later, courts continue relying on this line to deny all but the most limited procedural protections to migrants who have not been inspected and legally authorized to enter the United States. By the 1950s, when Ellen Knopf was spending time on, um, in this kennel-like facility, these days, we might call this a perrera. As those of you who follow news about border patrol stations are familiar with that term. By the 1950s, the Ellen Island facility needed to be, it was in bad shape, so it needed to be repaired or, or replaced or, or discarded. And in the White House was the war hero turned Republican president, Dwight Eisenhower. And no one had to tell Dwight Eisenhower about the dangers that the United States faced in the aftermath of World War II. And yet, instead of fixing up the Ellis Island prison, Eisenhower chose to shut it down. On November 11, 1954, the very first Veterans Day, 
Eisenhower's Attorney General, a man named Herbert Brownell, presided over a naturalization ceremony at Ebbets Field, home of the old Brooklyn Dodgers. And while there, he announced the government's new position. He said, the, today the little island between the Statue of Liberty and the skyline and piers of New York seems to have served its purpose. A few days later, the New York Times was reporting on this, 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 uh, this new policy and it wrote, the last detained alien, a Norwegian seaman who had overstayed his shore leave was a passenger on the battery bound ferry. The United States government knew who this Norwegian seaman was. His name was Arne Peterson. The United States government knew that he had had permission to enter the country to work, and then he was supposed to leave. And the United States government knew that he had not left. And the United States government knew where he was. He was in their custody inside that Ellis Island prison. And it was the United States government that let him out, put him on a ferry into Manhattan, and none of us, not the United States government or anyone else, knows what happened to Arne Peterson after that. So if the Cold War was not enough to stop Eisenhower from shutting down immigration prisons, then I think that it's time for us, all these years later, to be equally courageous. I think we have to stop constraining our vision of what is deemed possible. We hear a lot about what's not possible. It's not possible to change the way that we do things. It's not possible to prod Congress into doing thing about anything about immigration. And if it's not possible to change anything, then what's the point of trying? What's the point of imagining the impossible? Well, I think it's fitting in times like these to remember the words of a man who knew how to blow fire into words, James Baldwin. I start the book with Baldwin's prodding words toward the end of The Fire Next Time, his famous essay. He says, he writes, I know that what I am asking is impossible. But in our time, as in every time, the impossible is the least that one can demand. We have to ask for the impossible. Because we know what happens if we do not alter course. Anyone who follows the news can rattle off many reasons to be sad about the state of the world. And that's certainly true of immigration policies in the United States today. Instead of getting mired, in this despair. I think there are a few steps that we can all take to help push our country toward a future that, at least when it comes to the lack of immigration prisons, uh, looks a little bit more like our past. First, join forces with your courageous neighbors, several of which are sitting in this room with us tonight. Here in Seattle, that includes people like La Resistencia, for many years, La Resistencia has focused on shutting down the Northwest Detention Center, that facility that um, I recently renamed, but that continues to lock up migrants. I've admired the work that La Resistencia has been doing for, for many, many years. They're among the most courageous, most cutting edge advocates who are thinking critically and acting fearlessly about immigration prisons. They're right here, they're your neighbors. Earlier today, I had the opportunity to chat with them and chat with members of One America who are committed to shutting down your local immigration prison. And second, vote. But don't just vote reflectively. reflexively. Immigration prisons didn't start in January 2017 when Donald Trump meandered into the White House. And they won't and whenever Donald Trump leaves the White House. Immigration prisons were born with bipartisan support and they grew with bipartisan support. 
There were more people locked up in immigration prisons than ever before under President Barack Obama until President Trump. So Republicans need to be reminded that this is a costly experiment in depriving people of liberty. And Democrats could stand to be reminded that immigration prisons do not promote public safety. And it doesn't matter whether there's a private company running them or a local government doing so. Immigration prisons are always violent, always. So I wrote Migrating to Prison. America's obsession with locking up immigrants precisely to shine a light out of this whirlpool of misery. This is a book born from a profound commitment to hope. Just like James Baldwin tells us to do. So I implore you to join me in that hope and to take actions that might make that hope into reality. Thank you. Hi. Um, Hi, how are you? I'm good. Uh, I, just, I wrote this down. Um, can you talk about the relationship between uh, immigration prisons and climate change? Uh, I know uh, more and more migrants from Central America are seeking respite from the effects of climate change, especially in that area. Uh, do you feel like this influx in climate refugees will bolster country's current stance on immigration prisons or perhaps the, have the opposite effect? Thank you. Yeah, as um, more people are displaced by the economic and environmental uh, impacts of climate change, and we can expect more people to leave wherever it is that they call home. Um, and given long-standing migratory patterns, long-standing relationship between the United States and um, uh, many countries around the world, but most most uh, most uh, uh, pronounced um, countries in in Central America, um, I think what we, what we're seeing now with um, with migrants from Central America making their way to the United States is is um, only likely to 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 increase, um, and if we if what we do is decide that the proper course of action for uh, the United States is to respond to that um, that Central American migration um, with the, the 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 harsh edge of 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 the options that are available to it through through prisons, um, and if we if we decide that now, then. There's no reason why we wouldn't, wouldn't decide that when, when more people are starting to come. So I think rather than wait for, for those impacts to, to um, get worse, um, I think the, the time is now to start thinking hard about what, it, how, what the proper uh, immigration policy response is um, in that future that um, sadly seems, seems to be coming. Can you talk about Trump's policies of now keeping migrants in Mexico? What what impact that is having on migration and just the conditions? Yeah, the uh, they call it the Migrant Protection Pro Protocol. Um, it's it, it's re there's a policy that the Trump administration put into place with regard to asylum seekers um, that requires that uh, folks wait out the. The, the, the process of requesting asylum in Mexican border towns. Now, these are many of these are Mexican border towns with which I've, I have a long life, lo, a lifelong um, uh, familiarity. Uh, places where where I was visiting frequently as a as a child and as a younger adult. Um, but uh, and and so these these are places that for for me are um, you know are, are 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 very important on a personal level. Um, but they're also places that I've seen transform. Um, in, in many ways, some of these communities are really quite dangerous, um, and, uh, and, and certainly more so when you are a, a member of a vulnerable group, like a, like a, a, a person who is, who's made their, your way there um, um, uh, fleeing persecution, fleeing violence. Um, and so what we're seeing is that in communities along the 
Texas border, um, there are lots of um, uh, encampments, um, tent encampments along um, the sides of uh, bridges leading into into Texas, and uh, I think the the, the 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 hopeful side of this is that there are lots of um, good people in these communities for whom migration isn't a scary phenomenon about somebody else somewhere else, but it's. You know, these are people like me, who, who, for whom migration is a is a personal story, a person maybe a story that they didn't live themselves individually, but you know, one that is in their family, one that's in their community. And so there are lots of advocates in these communities who have responded to the um, to the Trump administration's uh, um, uh, policy initiatives by by doing what they can, providing food and um, clo and clothing and. Blankets. For a while, there was a, there were school lessons happening on a on a bridge um, for kids. Um, all done by volunteers. Um, all done in one of the poorest uh, parts of the United States. Um, so so certainly uh, 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 people who could use um, support, um, whether that's in um, through sweat or or or, th or through through financial support. In California, they um, passed a law to prohibit private detention centers. And can you talk about what they're doing in California? Are they just letting the people out, or what is happening? Yeah, so um, a, a, the, the governor of California um, a few months ago signed a Signed a, a law that would um, that goes into effect actually in January, January first. And um, yeah, the, the the goal is to make it impossible for, for private prison corporations to, to operate. And there's a sort of a, a, a gradual um, scale down a process, but that's, that's the end. That's the, very clearly the, the end goal. I mean, no one's, no one's um, denying that. Um, and so, so uh, of course, what, the, the, what this means for, for private prison corporations is that they need to think strategically about how, maintain, how to maintain their business. Um, and, uh, and so what we've, we've saw in the, I think it was something like five days after the governor signed that, that, um, that bill, um, ICE actually issued um, uh, no-bid um, contracts uh, for, for four, I think it was four facilities that already operate um, to see whether they could extend, they could get somebody who was interested in extending the contract. Well, it won't surprise you that um, the very same people who were interested in extending the contract were the very same people who already had a contract. Um, and the reason they did this, um, I mean, it seems clear to me. This is I, this is not what this is not what I says, um, but but it seems clear to me that if you do this five days after the this governor signs a law that's into uh, into effect that says. Um, these facilities have to shut down whenever their contract ends. Well, if you renew their contract for another five-year period, I mean, you're just buying time, right? Um, and, um, and, and, and so ICE is, seems to be a, a receptive partner with the private prison corporations to try to extend as long as possible the period of time that these existing facilities can continue to operate um, in sort of a business as usual model. Um, but then, but we'll see. We'll see what, what the end result is, will, will be. Um, one concern that, that activists uh, and, uh, often raise is, um, well, does this mean that uh, folks are just going to end up um, getting, getting uh, transferred to some, someplace else? Um, maybe, uh, maybe. But, um, but, but I think from my perspective is that um, this is a way of raising um, awareness of the fact that this population of people exists, that somebody is profiting handsomely from the uh, from human bondage, um, and the, also um, suggests that there is there are levers that can be pulled to raise the cost of engaging in these business practices. Um, I found it very telling when you were highlighting the politically convenient distinction between um, criminal criminalization of migrants versus, um, you know, family migrants, as well as the claim of the Bureau of Prisons to be interested in detaining migrants who had broken the law versus ICE's claim of detaining migrants um, in terms of trying to decide whether or not they should be deported and the reality that those categories are very blurred. And um, my question is, to the extent that the abolition of migrant detention centers uh, is successful, what do you think uh, the risk or likelihood is of 
efforts to extend the criminalization aspect in order to try to sort of bolster the ability to detain people who are crossing the border. Yeah, well, I'd say that um, long before the abolition of private prisons, long before the uh, the 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 headway that the um, uh, advocates here in Washington have made uh, made in order uh, against um, uh, uh, immigration prisons that are operated by public entities, um, ever long before any of that ever rose to be successful. Um, the criminalization of migrations had, of migrants had already started. Um, so do I think that that will be used as an excuse to increase um, that or to continue pushing that trend upward? Yeah. Um, but I think we've, 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 if you look at the, 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 the data about um, uh, the, the criminal prosecution of, of uh, immigration crimes, we see that going back to the last few years of the George W. Bush administration, that number, been, and that number started growing pretty, um, pretty significantly, not because there was a new crime on the books. It wasn't. Um, illegal entry and legal reentry, they've, they've, they've been on the books since 1929. Um, it was almost a century, and, and they weren't used really almost almost ever until until the last few years of the Bush administration, and that continued under President Obama, and it certainly has continued under President uh, President Trump. Um, so so I think um, I think the answer to your question is we're already there. Hi. Um, I'm curious whether your research has led you to um, examples of other countries that are destinations for asylum seekers um, and how they uh, process incoming migrants without using the type of detention system that we have here. Yeah, I think one of the things that um, is, it, it is, is, is important to, for, for me never to forget is the, the impact that the U.S. has on other, other countries. So I, I was, um, uh, I wrote a lot of the book actually um, in Slovenia, um, and and um, it's a certain case you're not immediately able to put Slovenia on the map. Um, it's northeast of Italy, south of Austria, um, and um, one of the things I, I, I learned while doing this work, while writing this this book there and talking to people about it was everyone's interested in what's happening in the U.S. Um, in part because of the economic and military footprint um, that, that we still have, um, but in part because we, we still le legitimate a lot of conduct. Uh, if, 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 it's, if it's acceptable for the U.S. to do it, then it's acceptable for others to do it. Um, and so other, other countries with, um, with governments that have uh, tendencies toward um, to, to adopt um, harsh approaches to, to, to migrants, um, look to the U.S. model. Not necessarily, not always for money, um, although we, we certainly do see that. We see that with regard to, to um, the Mexican government in particular um, recently. Um, but, but oftentimes just as, a, as um, a political example or an intellectual example of what is an appropriate course of action, an, an acceptable course of action. And so, yeah, we do see that the UK is, is increasing its, its uh, um, uh, confinement of, of migrants. We see in Australia a uh, similar situation in, in Europe. I see pressure from the EU towards some of the, um, uh, the smaller countries um, um, along the periphery of the EU to, to try to do um, some, some of the same. Um, and, and so just because, um, so we're not necessarily alone, we do more of it um, by far, um, but just because we're in plentiful company doesn't mean we're in good company. Hi, so the Trump administration has proposed and I believe tabled um, a push to brand Mexican drug cartels as terrorist organizations. And I was wondering if you could comment on what implication that has for people who move through Mexico and might encounter mm -hmm. those cartels who might seek an immigration benefit in the US. Mm -hmm. And then more broadly, I'm wondering if you have any advice on how we can push to disaggregate national security interests from uh, immigration policy because it seems that most of the most inhumane uh, immigration policy changes have been made in the name of national security. Yeah, 
So I think I think the answer to your question about the cartels being you know, uh, designated as terrorist organizations is, is somewhat answered by the fact that, that it's been tabled. Um, it, 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 it would make it harder to deny asylum claims in particular by folks who are fleeing from these these organizations. Now, I, I've I've learned. I've, I, my lesson under the Trump administration, just because it's harder to do something doesn't mean that they won't, right? Um, I, I, can, I won't put it past them to decide that somebody is fleeing from a terrorist and yet not deserving of our protection, right? Um, so that's just, that's just the reality we're living in. Now, for, uh, when it comes to your, your question about national security and immigration, uh, yeah, that certainly is true. The, a lot of, a lot of um, um, harsh immigration law reforms and policy responses do come uh, very directly from, from concerns about national security in 1996 after the Oklahoma City bombing, um, despite the fact that it was two very white men who, or a group of very white men who, who, who committed that atrocity. Um, some of the legislation that, that results from Congress it d directly affects uh, immigration law and makes it easier to, 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 uh, um, to, to find yourself locked up and harder to get out. Um, that said, um, I think there's actually hope in 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 in, in the, the in the past. Um, uh, the, again, the, the Eisenhower administration, national security was the justification for Ellen Knopf being locked up in that facility, and she wasn't the the only one who was in that in that uh, Ellis Island facility for that that very reason. Um, the government insisted for years, we can't tell you this. Uh, the, you are so dangerous to us, Ms. Ms. Knopf, that that um, if we just tell you. Why? Why you're dangerous? That's gonna. That's that's gonna make. That's gonna bring the whole thing down. Right? It turns out. So she was able to get enough. She was mount a PR campaign, got support from a bunch of newspaper editorial boards and members of Congress, and they finally, despite the Supreme Court saying, "Look, the government doesn't have to give her a hearing at all." Period. Uh, they actually convinced the Attorney General to give her a hearing, just for political reasons only. Um, Turns out, the evidence against her was really flimsy. Um, the government eventually, the Attorney General actually released her. Um, and it turns out they got divorced. Um, so, I mean, I mean, this was a stressful time. Like, the beginning of their relationship and she was locked up for a long part of it. So, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't wish this on anyone. Um, but, it, what it shows is that even in, 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 at least in that moment when, when a national security was at the forefront of everyone's mind, right? The, Soviet, the threat that the Soviet Union presented to the United States was, was, was very real, very real. Um, and Eisenhower certainly knew that. And yet we were able to disaggregate that. And so I don't know, maybe there's something to be said about the, the courageousness of, of, of Dwight Eisenhower. Um, I, I don't, I'm not convinced that he was uh, that special. Uh, I, think, I think there must be someone among us who also has the courage, the courage to, to, to think hard about whether it makes sense to do this and, and to simply categorically point to the threat of national security. Um, that seems overly simplified to me. Hi, thank you for your work. Um, two questions. One, can we determine how many centers of detention there are mm -hmm. combined using the motels and the nursing homes and the city and county jails, um, as well as the uh, direct ICE detention centers? And then uh, the second question, apart from writing amazing books, um, what actions, such as direct action or legislation or um, the hunger strikes by the prisoners themselves, what do you think will have the most impact toward um, closing down the detention centers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so what, how, many, how many facilities? Um, well, we, yeah, that's a, that's a hard one to, to, to answer, um, largely because um, the number changes a lot. Um, ICE, um, a lot of the facilities that ICE in particular, um, well, ICE and the U.S. Marshals use are um, county jails. So you just 
it, it rents bed space essentially from 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 county county sheriffs departments that run county jails, and and many of them it actually houses a fairly small number of people. So so the facility here in Tacoma is actually it's actually an outlier, right? It's about mm, 14, 1,500 beds, um, and so that makes it one of one of a, a, a one of the largest in the entire um, network, and then that's all it does too, right? Whereas county jails, um, most what they're supposed to do primarily is to uh, lock up for a short period of time people who are arrested on suspicion of some criminal activity or who have been punished to a, a few months up to up to a year most uh, generally um, uh, for some for, for some for some crime and so it's it's actually hard um, to to keep track from uh, from year to year um, and so I, I hesitate to to give you a, a good number on that um, but um, the population overall um, hovers in the four to five hundred thousand uh, range of people per per year, and um, that that to me is that's the number I tend to use more frequently because it I think it's more meaningful than just the number of facilities where some of them might have held one person right or two people. Um, what actions? Um, organizing, I think community organizing is the most important thing. Um, I don't think it's. Um, Lobbying Congress. I don't think it's lobbying the president. Um, this is this is a policy with uh, with with bipartisan support. Um, so I mean, clearly, right now, th there's no point in lobbying the president. Um, but um, but as I said before, um, President Obama presided over the largest immigration prison population in the history of the U.S. until Trump. Right, and so for a while, at the beginning of his administration. You know, maybe there was an argument to be made that this was a, a political calculation to try to bring Republicans to the negotiating table. Um, okay, I mean, that I, I was a difficult to swallow um, argument, but in, in the first couple of years, but it became pretty evident after a while that the Republicans weren't interested in negotiating with Obama on, on immigration, right? And yet the policy continued. Uh, and so I think some of some some uh, high-level Obama officials actually believed it. And um, uh, Joe Biden's comments recently, um, when he was challenged by an activist on on the Obama administration's record, I think reflects that. When he said, you know, paraphrasing, but he said something like, "Go vote for Trump," right? That's the that, that's the response of somebody who who actually thinks that what they were doing is was the right course of action. Um, so so for me, it's. The, 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 the most fruitful um, uh, avenue of advocacy is, is not in the courtrooms, it's not in the halls of Congress. I think it's actually organizing communities um, like some of the folks uh, here in, here in the, uh, the Pacific Northwest have been doing for years. This will be our last question. Hi. Hi, can you? Hi. Hello, can you speak to uh, what you see as the, the most credible arguments against closing the immigration prisons or, or those that are closest to being credible and any and how you think best to counter those yeah um i think i think the the the, the hardest arguments um to 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 deal with are the people who um don't have a chance of um of winning a a, a claim to stay in in the u.s um and, and the reality is that there are a lot of those people. Um, we often hear well, that, 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 that migrants should get in line. For lots of people, poor people in particular, there, there is no line to, to get into. Um, and so I think for those folks, you know, the, oftentimes the best that I could do as a, as a lawyer is just say, look, there's nothing. There's just no, there's no claim I can make on, on your behalf. So you know, save your money. And, you know, go back to wherever you're gonna get deported to and you know, do whatever it is you're gonna do, right? Which often meant coming back, trying again to, to come back. Um, I think the response for those folks is that um, we, all, we, we do need to align um, uh, immigration law um, with, with the, 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 the version of the political community that we currently are, not the version of the political community that we imagined ourselves ourselves being at, at, at one point, um, and 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 because I'm what I'm asking for is, you know, to dream of of the impossible. Then, I actually think it's pretty realistic that by the time that we're ready as a nation 
to shut down immigration prisons, we'll also be ready to radically reform um, the avenues by which people can come into the United States. These things um, aren't divorced from one, an one another. They, they operate in tandem with one another. So thank you all very much for coming out here tonight.